Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 43rd, I think, maybe 44th fireside talk, but importantly, the first ever on a Sunday evening. And how exciting is that? I've been looking forward to it all day. And when I was reflecting in August about the series, I just thought it would be good to have the opportunity to uh, reflect more about deeper meanings in life uh, than the uh, fascinating talks that we have, but which don't tend to be reflective. So whether um, you are looking and, and listening tonight, and whether you are Christian or another faith or agnostic or atheistic or none of the above, um, doesn't matter. Um, I hope very much that you'll just get something from uh, listening to Marie Elsa Bragg, who is going to be talking to begin with. And let's just begin just with a moment's collection. So if we just uh, inhaling to the count of three and out to three. And um, that's a practice which I used a lot as a teacher and as a head. Um, and um, I'm going to begin now by uh, reminding everybody to have questions. Uh, and it's very much these sessions are very much um, back and forth. Uh, so do type your questions in. And if you are on a system whereby you can't type them into the Teams, if you email uh, matthew.thompson with a P, T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N at Buckingham, the University of Buckingham's organised the talks, dot ac dot uk matthew dot thompson at buckingham dot ac dot uk then matt will then pass the question into the system that i can see on my screen and i'll ask your question so please do ask questions i mean there are so many questions about this topic so um over to you marie elsa um it's really wonderful to have you uh here tonight uh and uh, many people will know your work uh, and have read uh, one or both of your books that came out in 2018 and 2019 uh, and will certainly have, have read about you. Uh, and thank you, it's really wonderful, it's wonderful to have you here tonight. And could you begin maybe just by doing what we do, which is to ask uh, the person who's talking to describe the room that we're in because we could not do that if we were listening to you uh, say at um, a literary festival in the Lake District or in Hay on Wye. So where are we and is this where you do a lot of writing and thinking? <laughs> Thank you, it's lovely to be with you. Um, this is my study and I've had to get used to people looking into my study during the um, pandemic because everything was come on Zoom and my computer is a very old computer that is actually locked into the network in situ. So here it is, and this is where I write. Um, I don't really know what to tell you about it. I've got my mother's paintings behind me, which were painted in 1968 during the, just after, in the summer after the riots in Paris. You'll all know about the 1968 revolution that was happening there. They're quite special to me because my grandfather, her, her father, was the head of the Sorbonne and he was locked in the Sorbonne at that time and got, um, got I don't know, played by the French government because he told them not to bring in the police and then they did and then they blamed him and it was, was awful for him and the family. And then they went to Provence where he's from and uh, she painted those. And, um, You'll yeah. probably talk about your uh, mother, um, who you talk about in your second uh, book, um, perhaps when you're talking. And then just finally, that looks like a Jewish prayer shawl hanging over what looks like a chest of drawers. Uh, what is that? <laughs> that, that's a that is a Jewish prayer shawl, which I got about 20 years ago in 
in Jerusalem. I use it for prayer. I studied at the Leo Beck Rabbinic College for a couple of years, Jewish mysticism, Jewish festivals, um, very strong relationship with with Judaism. So it's a, a big part of, uh, it, I like having it around. And of course, Judaism, Christianity being so um, close and in the same route, uh, Jesus being a very good uh, rabbi at the time, then uh, it, it means a lot to me. So there we are. And we're going to uh, begin um, with Mary Elsa talking uh, for a while. Then I'm going to ask some questions and then we're going to open up to questions. So the general theme of this discussion is about uh, spirituality, but also Marie Elsa, Mary Elsa's life. I mean, how did she come to believe uh, 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 what, what you believe in? And so your life journey, uh, over to you. Thank you, my life journey. Um, that's a very big question. Um, so I've been thinking about what to share with you um, on that. And I suppose there are different times when we all get sort of awakened. Um, and I guess I could describe some of those times that I've had uh, with you. Please do. But I think that at the beginning, I was born into um, uh, a family that were sort of in, in, in the process of change. So I was born into the, the, the sort of revolution that was happening in 68 in France. And my mother was very uh, artisan. She loved Brel and Piaf and um, existentialism. And, and my father was from a, a northern um, a northern community, his my uncles and grandfathers and everything were miners or farmhands, but a, a very inspired uh, a gentleman came from Oxford and took over the local school and gave suddenly gave uh, his generation the opportunity to uh, to stay on after eleven. He, he managed to talk my grandfather into letting my father stay on at school, and so I, when I was born, my father was moving across social boundaries. Um, uh, as well with the arts as a stallion, if you like. Um, and so that's the environment I was born into, the idea of creativity, um, change, human rights, um, and the capacity for great movement. And I think that's something that I'm really reviewing right now because we um, we're looking at that again now. It's, it's come back in full force and I'm I'm thinking about it. Really. Um, then when I was six, my, my mother died. Um, uh, it was a tragic suicide. Um, it was one of those suicides that happened in the summer <clears throat> and um, could have not happened, but did. Uh, and I think <clears throat> for me, uh, you know, a little six year old, I think one of the things that did for me, I was thinking about it this morning, knowing I was going to talk to you, I think one of the things that did for me was it slightly switched off the um, rational part of my brain. It, because um, I was I was quite a thinky little girl, I think. And I think it slightly switched that off and opened me to a much more, um, kind of mythological, experiential, um, slightly emotional, but very deeply intuitive way of uh, experiencing the world. And I think from then onwards, I was looking for, for meaning, for what was really going on, sort of seeing through things, that, that place between dream and, and awake. Um, and I think that's been a place that I've I've inhabited and I still in, inhabit now. I became a, a, a dancer, uh, let's call it 15, became a dancer. And um, that for me was very much about ritual and theatre and um, movement, all uh, coming together and body language. And again, that kind of uh, experience of intuitive relationship. Um, and I was looking for my religion at that time. I, I had been brought up with 
French Catholic Cistercian uh, Provençal very strongly, um, a Northern Protestant. Um, I think I have some Jewish roots on my mother's side, but we can't trace them after Poland. And um, but that's what I was brought up around. But I couldn't find it very much alive um, in in my generation. It was an interesting time. Judaism was quite alive. I was brought up in North London, um, so that was really interesting. But um, I think I decided that I needed to um, um, explore, and I, I went to Buddhist meetings, Tibetan Buddhist meetings. North London was full of these kind of things. Um, <clears throat> and then I got a, a job after I toured with the company, and I got a visit job with a Brazilian company, and that year they toured Europe, which was not <laughs> which was a bit of a shame. But then I got a job, um, I was looking into dance therapy, and I got a job uh, because I had good choreographic notation with a a team, a Diane Fossey team mm. uh, in Stirling University and um, studying primates and body language in primates and following a lady who I admired, a deeply spiritual woman called Jane Goodall, who I, I just felt really a real connection with. Um, but then sadly I got very ill, um, something tropical, um, and then had to learn and then that, uh, there was a big gap in my life there, about eight, nine years. And then I had to learn to walk again and all of those things you do and things that bad. And um, then it was very, even though I was very driven before, um, from then on I was just asking the one question, how do I get closer to God? How do I understand this relationship? How can I serve? How can I serve? I don't know how long I've got and for whatever amount of time I've got I want to give as much as I can, do as much as I can and that's sort of been on my shoulder ever since really um, and I thought I, I thought I, I trained with the Jesuits to be what they call a spiritual director which was three years you do 30 days silent retreats and in that silent retreat I I uh, thought about maybe becoming a Cistercian nun, but it seemed quite clear that wasn't the right path for me. Um, and I went to Oxford to study theology and and then it, the priesthood sort of came my way. And I've been a priest for for that long, but very much a female priest because it's been very, it, it's, you know, the church was exempt from the Sexual Discrimination Act in 67. And so I was in a, a position where I could go into a, a meeting with many men and they would legally be able to say, I'm sorry, you need to get out of here because you're a woman, you shouldn't be a priest. Um, and I had no legal rights compared to my friends who were lawyers. Or, so um, it was a real awakening to what women had gone through a couple of generations before me. And I developed this incredible humility, this incredible respect for how much we'd had to fight just to have a vote. Um, let alone kind of equal place, and how much more work needed to be done, but um, a big theme. And then once we were we, we were allowed to be women bishops, I I just needed to have a time a bit of time to be creative because I'd been in people's lives for 20 years, such an honour, you know, being with them birth, life, death in their families, worked in the estates on the Kilburn High Road for six years and this and Green Estates and Westminster Abbey and the House of Commons and, and um, uh, created creative retreats for many different people, business world, other people, Shakespeare retreats, goodness knows what, and I just needed to stop and say, okay, what, what do I make? What do I make of what I've seen so far? And how do I digest this? And what's what do I feel God really is right now? And when I look at the, you know, the climate situation and um, what is increasingly going to be a, uh, and has been for quite a while, a human rights situation, I think of it theologically liberation theology and. Um, really searching myself for what eco theology would look like. Um, I'm full of I'm full of uh, questions of wholeness, questions of how important these these uh, extremely beautiful and inspiring ideas are, 
and um, how important it is for them to not be dogmatic, but to be able to stand in their own beauty and evoke debate and questioning and a unifying community around that, that sense of, of uh, searching. And uh, um, so I'm very interested in, in looking at more. I think that's where I leave you right now and look forward to more of a conversation. Okay, so, so thank you very much for, for that. Can you begin by talking about the uh, two books towards Melbrake, which was a novel that came out in 2018. Um, why did you uh, write that? And will there be more? Was that your one novel that you've now got out of your system, the novel that we all want to write, we think we have inside us, or is it going to be uh, more following? Oh, well, um, actually, that was 2017. And that was... Sorry. That was what I... Well, that was the one I wrote just after the women women got the vote and I just went for a big walk in the Cumbrian Fells and um, just started writing. I needed to be in the fells, I needed to be creative, um, be in nature and um, no it's about living very closely to nature and being in a profound relationship with nature. And it was a sense also that this Cumbrian family that I love and have known so well and became, of course, an awful lot closer when my mother died. Um, you know, I'm very close to, I was very close to my great grandmother and my great aunts and uncles. My Auntie Mary lived in a, in Lampler in a very small cottage um, with gas lighting and an outdoor toilet. Um, and, uh, used a telephone when she finally got a telephone she used it as if it was morse code honestly <laughs> right, right boom and that would be it um but they lived they lived in in relationship with nature that uh, i felt was slowly going on of course we have our own language as well in cumbria one two three four five with yan tian tab and everything and all of that seemed to be slightly going on my watch and i wanted to honor them um, but I also wanted to look at what we were doing to the environment. And so there's a, it, 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 one of the rewarding, two, well, many rewarding things came out of that book. Um, but one is that it was used to um, uh, slightly lobby the government against organo, the use of organophosphates, um, uh, which keep creeping in, um, which are actually very poisonous for our nervous systems and create very bad diseases. Um, but the other thing is that there, there's a memorial, a place for all the farmers who've died of organophosphate poisoning. And um, they called me and, uh, and they put a tree up for every person and, and we plant this large forest. And they called me and asked if they could plant the tree for the main character, mm. as if he was real. Um, and that was incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, and whereabouts is that precisely? Well, it, it's the it, Crumut Water is yeah. um, a, a beautiful lake next to Buttermere. Buttermere is a bit more wonderful, north -west, but Crumut Water is uh, so in the, in the West Lakes. Yes, the Northwestern Fells. Uh, and so uh, that's that experience. And then, what were you trying to uh, talk about in your next? Um, book sleeping letters which is is a a wonderful mix um of different styles uh what prompted you to write that book which had an enormous impact um when it came out well it only came out last november mm. um and actually i've got i had a year of festivals booked in and they've all been cancelled so i'm not sure what's going to happen to that book but um that was, um, it was just, for me, it was just time to review my mother's suicide. Really. Um, I guess that happens in your life, you have times to review things. Um, my father had been um, um, uh, diagnosed and was very ill and um, he, he's miraculously recovered. Hmm. But it was a, 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 a cancer and we were all worried. So it just felt like a time to be able to 
say to both of them, um, everything I, everything I had, all the love and everything I had found so far, I, I wanted to just pour it out and um, give it to them um, before he went. And I went into silent retreat, two silent retreats, and I, I just, um, I just wrote. I think the Eucharist uh, helped me; it sort of held me. And having been a priest, I, I felt like I just described the meticulous detail of, of, of ritual of the Eucharist, and, um, and a very feminine Eucharist that I describe that it's to my mother and that's how I experienced it at that time. I, I'm certainly not saying that that is the only way it should be, um, but it, it is it is what it is. And that kind of held me. It's a, it's a ritual that's deeply in my soul and it, it held me. So that was one thing for me, but it was also one thing to give to them in a creative and loving and open way as an offering, no more, no less. And then really kind of try to, 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 to look into the mirror of it all with uh, strength and truth um, and, and really be able to look at the shadow of it and to be able to say, even this, you can come through. Uh, making it all nice hasn't worked. Making it, making everything, try to make, trying to make it kind of, uh, make it go away by saying, well, you know, it happened anyway, or it hasn't worked. There's, there's a guilt around that's, that's, that's just been uh, toxic. Um, uh, it seems to me, from what I've learned so far, and I'm still learning, um, let's let's go through the eye of a needle. Let's really let's really look at what at what happened. Um, and and I went in, and it was really frightening. It was heartbreaking. I wept. I was I was willing to not find a way through, but but. Uh, moving through the ritual and the ritual kind of kept me moving um, and then it was incredibly incredibly healing in 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 a in a real way where where sort of love and shadow come together and um, you say there about the literary festivals that you weren't able to speak at because of lockdown we we have 1500 people um, looking at, at this and, and I'm sure they'll want to explore the book and, and I hope uh, uh, buy it. Um, so it was cathartic writing that uh, and the relationship with your father, I mean we're all worried about what our parents think, if they are a great artistic figure, does that make it better or worse? And the special circumstances in which you're writing about him and what happened? Mm -hmm. Well, it's probably part of the reason why I didn't write for quite a while. Um, I probably didn't write until I found a place to write from that was uh, devotional and my voice and it didn't really matter anymore um, and I now am very I mean you know I'm proud of him he's he's traveled a long way in his life and given a lot um, so what was it like to hand it over to him well it was very moving um, he knew it was coming, but he didn't see it literally until it was published. Oh, really? Um, so, because I, yeah, I, I, it, I imagined, I imagined giving it to him and just sitting with him while he read it by the fire together. And my hope was that it would, 
to heal him. And it's quite interesting because that was, so it was published in November, I gave it to him last summer. Mm. Um, and uh, I think he's read it about five or six times, just keeps reading it. And I think there's a, there's a you know, he's, we've been on a big, a big soul journey, he and I, and um, I think there's a real, it's, it's lucky to, as, a, as an adult now, as a woman, to be able to turn around and say, um, thank you. Um, I, I, I know that I make loads of mistakes, we all make loads of mistakes. And I know that we're all kind of partly, partly culpable in so many ways. We're all slightly colluding. I think that's the horror that the pandemic has brought out for, for all of us. Oh my goodness, I'm, you know, uh, and the climate. And uh, how do you live with that? Um, I'm working with a, a, a large, um, or preparing to work for a, a large group of Extinction Rebellion youth who uh, are, are living a life which they believe they're not, never going to have children, they're never going to be old, which is uh, completely traumatic for them. And how do you how do you turn that into something creative and potential life giving? Um, that's the real key. That's the real question. And like any really beautiful tradition of which Christianity and Judaism, they're the two I know the most about, are have the most stunning mysticism and tradition to to hand over every generation has to renew it and regenerate it and and make it their own and apply it again and that's where you get the the alchemy and the gifts and the and the sort of space just like in a good poem the space for for grace to to move through and then in a way that's sort of what i did with the eucharist in in the book it's a very a deeply feminine body of christ that i'm handing to you there and I'm meticulously describing the ritual so that as I hand it over to you, my father and my mother and as I hand it over to anyone that they might get a sense of what it is to stand in the place of a priest because there is this beautiful theology of communion of priesthood which we, we all have that within ourselves. Did you ever doubt God and, and God's existence and to have had that experience as a girl aged six um, and who was encouraging you because um, your father, I might get this wrong, st is still agnostic isn't he? Mm. Melvin Bragg, have you kind of brought him more across or? Yeah a little bit, well no, <laughs> that would be the wrong way to describe it because that would put me in an evangelical kind of uh, position and I, I think if you're in that position in from what I see it's because you don't really believe in grace yeah uh, grace grace is yeah. you know if you're a spiritual director or a priest you're a third party helping other people find their relationship with grace it's it's not about you and it's not about people having to convert the way they think there's a presence and, uh, and, and some kind of deep sense of uh, a life happening around us and we all find our individual relationship with that. So I think he's, he's, he goes between atheist, agnostic, and you know, obviously he's, he's 80 now, so he's, he's uh, thinking a lot about what, what it means. Um, in, in a more sort of a more open and radical way, it's it's quite interesting how age can make us think. Well, actually, I don't want to conform to this way of thinking anymore. I don't want to conform to that. What do I really perceive? What is love really? You know, this word that becomes quite corny and overused. What is it really? How powerful is it really? Good questions. You just have such a a. a delightful relationship with your father. Um, not that doesn't happen to everybody. Um, and the, but the question about your faith, Mary Elsa, did you ever have, did you ever doubt the existence of God in your life? And when did, when did you first intimate 
the existence of God. I I feel that as a child, I had that childlike knowing. It just is how it is. And and also very confusing with the drama after my mother died. Just seeing so many people break. I mean everybody broke. My father had a breakdown, everybody broke. I have a good relationship with my father, but we work. I worked at it very hard. I've learned so much. I think I I rarely wanted to give up on love. But what God is, there are many times when I have no idea. And there are often times when I learnt like the Jesuit training I can I, I learn active imagination or imagination imaginative contemplation and I I have this imagining Christ and being on the shore of Galilee and I'm going into that and it it's really my practice for one year two years three years and then suddenly actually I've maybe become habitual or I've held on to it too much or um if I'm honest with myself, it doesn't it doesn't have that meaning anymore. Did it ever? I don't know. And I go into a period of complete doubt. But I think one of the things I have done, which I probably did learn very young, is to stay in the wind of the doubt and wait and see what's coming and refuse the balm of false truths. Um, so I, Life is short and love is amazing. And if if this grace is real, uh, then I want to see it even clearer and clearer. Um, but I think a faith, a lifetime of faith without doubt is a, is a, a sort of inhuman idea. And, and I always think that when I'm a priest, when I'm giving the Eucharist, that, you know, there's no, uh, all the people that come up, will be in all manner of different ideas, faith, doubt, belief, experiences, spiritual experiences, no spiritual experience at all, grief, have no idea, just going through the motions, want to get their kids into school. Who knows? There we all are in our humanity, all at the table. And I think that's the most important thing, all welcome at the table. I'm going to come over to questions now, but just let me ask you before then, Marielle, so is everybody everybody on a journey in life and and um, is that possibility of encountering God and truth, love, whatever you, however you want to describe it, is, is that an option for everybody or is it just an option for some people? Um, I would say that divine spark is not an option for everybody. It is the way everybody is made um, from what I have seen so far. That we are, well, all, we all partake in that divine spark, that Christ or that uh, spirit. And we are all on that journey, but it's not a, I don't think it's an option. I think it just is. Um, yeah. And Mary is asking the first question here uh, and is asking you to explore the relationship between science uh, and religion. And are they two different things? Um, and has science, as many um, atheists believe, um, made religion no longer necessary or relevant mm. or meaningful? That's a really good question. Um, thanks, Mary. Mm. Um, 
There's no question that the Enlightenment has changed the way we think and has put a lot of uh, weight on kind of rational, mechanistic ideas of the universe, of ourselves, of nature, very dangerous mechanistic ideas. Nevertheless, we have uh, um, extraordinary technology that allow us to be um, have a concept of a global community which is um, profound, um, amongst other things. Um, but the 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 opposition, in my mind, the opposition between science and religion um, only happen when they're both sort of institutional. Um, when they're in their essence, great mathematicians use their imagination. Um, I think it's Einstein uh, would, would say that maths helps him understand one thing, but imagination will help him understand the world. Um, and uh, uh, lots of people, I feel, are now having a look at the idea of the more the poetic mind needs to come back into play alongside the science um, and science is developing that you know there's that wonderful book I can't remember his name Sheldrake that young Sheldrake who's written that book that just came out recently on science. Yes. Um, he's Rupert Sheldrake's son but Sheldrake yeah. is the name yeah yes it, on on the the way Fungi is all all joined and it basically completely changes our understanding of how trees work and this lattice of, of kind of aliveness and collectiveness so, and you know, of course, quantum mechanics and the idea that two atoms are kind of in communication all the time, but we don't, but they don't, we can't really see how, but they, one does know, which some people like to say explains the fact that, you know, someone's going to call just before they call. And so all of this, that there's this sort of wholeness, we seem to be going towards this sense of an eco uh, philosophy or being able to understand the fact that not just that we are custodians of nature, but we are nature and that we all are somehow in really very much in relationship. It was it was Merlin Sheldrake, Merlin. great name, great name for a scientist who was a scientist, <laughs> uh, Merlin Sheldrake, who uh, had written the book. Um, uh, a, a couple of questions here um, about um, spirituality and mental health. Jane's saying, can spirituality help with people's mental health? Um, and well-being and another person saying I have experienced a lot of depression and difficulty in my life um, I'm not religious might religion help or harm mm. gosh they're good questions um, Spirituality is a is such a broad word at the moment, and it encompasses things like mindfulness, meditation, yoga, kind of Ill, inner wellness, affirmation of looking after our own health, our own well-being. Um, a kind of um, that that it, it encompasses a lot of that, and that uh, uh, and a lot of therapies are working alongside. Um, you know, acupuncture, yoga, meditation, um, stillness, silence, uh, and those things can be extraordinarily helpful. Um, however, if you've got something that you really need to work out, then finding a very good, to my mind, Jungian, because it would have a spiritual element to it, analyst, um, can be incredibly uh, life changing. But it's a kind of, it's a commitment and it's a, a, a year of work. Reading the life of the saints is also very useful because it kind of gives you, they're so intense, it can give you a map of the arc of how people's lives can be. We all seem to have this sort of, the same sort of archetypal uh, life, the same archetypal mm, shape of how our lives, how our, our processes work. Um, so that's one part of spirituality. Being in community is another part of spirituality. It can really help finding either whether it's a church, whether it's a local monastery, whether it's a synagogue, but finding a community of people who are open to everybody being human. And we all suffer from 
uh, hard times and we can all get low and some people suffer more than others and that's just some people suffer from other things more than others and just to allow that full humanity look for the places that really welcome that full humanity. Adele says how can I um, uh, deepen, um, lost it, um, how can I uh, deepen my spiritual uh, uh, life? Um, any, any thoughts for what she could do? Um, I just wanted to add one last thing about the spiritual path is that when you when you um, commit to a path, it doesn't necessarily make life easier. It, um, apart from the self care ideas that I've been talking about, but it can make uh, life more fluid or it can give you a sense of how to watch how to interact but it doesn't stop the hard things necessarily happening um and adele i think that it, it's a very hard question to answer in a, in a in a general way because it really depends the main thing is it depends on you the um the teachings are out there the mystics are out there the music's out there the long long history of musicians looking at things or artists or um, and the biggest question we get to ask ourselves is how can we give ourselves permission to be really how we are designed that each one of us is truly designed by God or the divine or the spirit to be all that we can be and so it might be that actually dance is your way or painting is your way or prayer or maths or philosophy or it's really about what is your way with the divine because all of those can be held by any really decent tradition and but the when it, what makes things difficult is when traditions try to say like schools try to say there is only one way and this is how you should do it no as soon as you go into any real monastic trainings to be kind of spiritual director the very first thing you learn is all the different types of people and to help them stop listening to the school teacher who told them they couldn't draw or, or or this is how you should do things to actually start listening to who they really are to loving their design because in the old-fashioned language the best thing you can do is to express yourself allow yourself to be the beloved goodness uh, Luke is asking this question, by the way, if you would prefer to uh, not for me not to mention your name by name, if it's a very personal question, of course I won't. So I'm presuming that Luke doesn't mind uh, this. Um, I lost my partner uh, recently uh, and questioned why I exist. Uh, I found that I needed to understand God to answer that. But how do I understand God? Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry that happened to you. It's very painful. I'm sorry that happened. Love is extraordinary and it's very hard when you lose the, that closeness of that person. I, I find that I, I can't even begin to believe that this whole construction that we're in um, is purely material. And, and, and when we love somebody, we know that it's that we have a soul, old fashioned word, but there's that sense of um, something more than. And so I am very, for me, aware, and I don't impose this on anyone, but for me, I'm very aware that the people that I've lost are continuing in another way. I have no, I don't really understand, I don't know how. I'm being honest with you and I, I guess I need to be honest with you because this is a very honest question from you. Um, there are times when I have seen people and when I take a funeral in general, um, from the moment I'm given the funeral to the moment I take the funeral, I probably will sense or see somehow that person, even though I may never have met them before. So I have a sense of that. 
happening, but I, I can't explain it in any dogmatic way. How do you find God? Well, the bigger picture is really important to, um, and for me, being able to say, I, I don't even understand the bigger picture, but I, I surrender because I, I pledge to keep my heart alive. I pledge to keep loving. And I don't understand what the bigger picture is, but I'm just going to sit as if I'm sitting in front of the ocean and allow myself to not know. And I'm going to stay, stay there with it. Um, but I'd love to talk more about this. And I'm, I'm thinking of um, trying to do a, get them up on YouTube, do a series of talks with theologians to really explore this a lot more because I feel that this, that this conversation needs to be um, out there. And I, I, I often can't find it myself. So um, perhaps if I do more, you'd be able to join, join me with that and we'll. Uh, I'm doing. I'm interviewing um, Professor Fiddes on Saturday night for a, for a, an event. And I've managed to get. He's in his 80s, but he's one of the great process theologians. And process theology is very exciting because it's it's it's. I think I'm hoping, but I'm looking for it. It seems to be the nearest idea of being able to describe a sense of real presence, but a whole creativity. I'm looking for what, what eco-theology would be. So it's a surrender, being willing to, willing to explore, and, and all of that love is worth keeping the flame alive. There are so many questions. I was going to ask you about the cloud of unknowing, but we won't go out there because I'm going to get through as many as I can. Lee is asking, um, is religion lost amongst young people today? It seems less and less part of their lives. And Adam says, um, how can we get people to engage uh, or acquire a spiritual mind? Mm, gosh. Um, well, a lot of the young people that I uh, meet and work with, they're really exploring um, shamanism, ayahuasca, philosophy, very into quantum mechanics or and, and indigenous religions are yeah. coming back. The idea of mythological thinking. They're really, really searching, soul searching, but they are against institutions. And one of the jobs I feel that I have is to try and help that rootedness um, and say, OK, what's your what's your heritage? OK, and, and which whichever heritage it is, OK, look at your tradition keep your roots and um, explore, rejuvenate, but keep your roots. And here's a few reasons why. First thing is that you have an incredible record of thousands of humble men and women who have left you messages in those teachings, in those beautiful, the poetry, um, they've left you messages and they want, it's a legacy they want to pass on build on it. You've only got one lifetime, build on it. The second thing is, look back at your religion square in the eye because it will have made the most horrendous mistakes. I mean, look at Christianity. Oh my goodness. If we don't keep that, if we don't own it, we are in danger of letting it happen again. And the next 50 years are really quite important to um, uh, you know, nationalism, uh, very dangerous Christianity could easily rise up. And if we don't kind of have a look at that and work out what the, the, the signs are and how to keep that, the mystical beauty of that, that often you know, in, in history has gone underground. People have had to share books um, uh, secretly because they're not allowed to read them. We've got to be really careful that we keep some of that alive. There's so much more to say on each one of these questions. There, there is. Uh, and, um, we're now up to well over 2000 looking at this. I've just been told by Matt, who is our technician. James is asking a, a practical question with so many uh, young people uh, taking their own lives um, or attempting to what support and advice. Mary Elsa, can you offer the young um, and old to help 
answer the question, does life really matter at all? Um, um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm I'm president of a Cumbrian uh, Cumbrian a, a Cumbrian organisation that supports families of who have had uh, suicide in their family, and it's it's a really really difficult. The numbers are going up for young people. So, thank you for that question. The answer is this: there's so much to talk about on this subject, and it's fundamental. Um, number one, if you think that somebody is in trouble, please can we let go of this uh, individualistic idea of community and go back to the old traditional way of talking to someone, asking them how they are, being them for them, bringing them food. We've found that again in COVID. We really have. We've clapped for the NHS. We've all gone out shopping for the elderly people in our area, left carefully at the doorstep, washed it all before they, so they didn't have to. We've done all of those things. Bring that back, talk to them. And if they're really difficult, that's okay, because it's normal. When you're in trouble, it's really normal for you to behave badly. So stick with them. They need friends. Find help. They're an amazing charity. This world, but this country, but this world also, is full of incredible people who are donating their, their evenings and their lives to providing these most incredible charities. They make really big network. Get hold of them, get the help, get the charities, get these people on board. There are, if you ever feel depressed about what's happening in the world, open your eyes to the millions of people who work for Oxfam, for, for um, charities, for uh, bereavement, for suicide watch, for children, for domestic violence. These people volunteer and they're good people and they often volunteer because they've experienced it themselves. So they're really good to talk to. Um, and spiritually, um, quite apart from the sense of community, the ethic of really being allowed to be human with each other um, and developing that, spiritually, the idea of uh, um, a something, a bigger picture, um, a, a loving God, if that's possible, um, a sense of uh, something being a balm that's possible for everybody somehow and be allowing ourselves to not understand it and still be with it. That's got to be a start. The other thing I just want to say one more thing is I'm a great believer often in a sense of place. It really affects a lot of us. I see lots of people going into an empty church, not when it's full or when the service is going, but into an empty church. That's partly because there's this atmosphere of prayer or particular mountains or a particular valley or something. So perhaps also look for places to go with that person that have a sense of place that really allows them to organize themselves in a different way. I feel like when I go into this ancient 12th century, very, very small church called St. Vida's, which is on the side of a lake, Bathenswaite in Cumbria. If I go there and I sit, it's quite chilly, very small. Somehow those walls reorganize my psyche and they kind of reorganize my body and it kind of reorganizes my life. And I ground. And somehow there's a there's a familiarity there. There's a almost like an archetypal parenthood or and an archetypal divine really there. And I think there's uh, probably real benefit in in looking for that as well. There's a lot more to say. Uh, two questions, which uh, we have five minutes left, uh, uh, and but there are lots more I want to ask too. Hattie says, how would you describe uh, heaven, Mary Elsa, how do you get there? Um, and, then, <laughs> and then, oh, I've lost it. Hang on. Um, uh, Martin says also, uh, uh, how, uh, what's heaven like and how can I get there, please? Oh, two questions about heaven. <laughs> they are two questions <laughs> about heaven. Heaven like. <laughs> I bet you don't get many of those. Yeah. Maybe you do. Thank you for that question. What's heaven like? 
what is distilled sustaining extraordinary love like what do we see in the sea in the oceans when we see their beauty what is it like when the sun rises again and we forgot to hold on to the habit of expecting it and it's extraordinary what's it like if somebody we really love surprises us and turns up If there's heaven on earth and hell on earth, no question, it's both. But it seems to me that the amazing amount of beauty we're surrounded by on this planet that we really need to defend and the incredible capacity we have for compassion and love is extraordinary. And that's got to be some kind of taste of what's possible. Sherry is asking, what is grace? She's also, she's asking lots of questions, uh, including what's the Eucharist, but maybe just take grace and will grace get me to heaven? Oh, uh, gosh, what's the Eucharist? That's a great, great get me to heaven. Which it feels like maths. Will grace get me to heaven? Will grace get me to heaven? There was a uh, a, a nurse in the um, COVID ward in St Thomas's who said she could see um, some kind of. Um, she didn't think it was a being something on people's beds like a presence um, and she didn't know if it was waiting to take them away uh, will grace take me to heaven it's like saying will the presence of the divine be my pathway will uh, the breath of god be my new breath in the afterlife is that breath of God in the air that I breathe now it's such an incredible thing that we get to even breathe um, so I guess in a way the answer to that question is um, uh, something that every mystic uh, for centuries have, have have held and I think what I'm also trying to say is that in order to really contemplate uh, the, the spirit, the theology, the divine, we don't have to, we must, can include, we don't have to only use our, our rational minds, you know the whole right and left brain thing that's, that we're all thinking about at the moment, use both sides um, and and uh, 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 we are looking to be more um, participatory or to uh, to acknowledge how we uh, experience nature in particular at the moment. Uh, allow the that kind of more essential and sometimes sometimes people call it more ancient uh, way of of perceiving um, and see if it's real because from from where I'm looking. It's it's the emperor's new clothes. You know that old fable of someone talked the emperor into wearing a, a very beautiful uh, a suit, and he was so flattered by it that he he wore it to procession, and actually was completely naked. And everybody was saying, "Oh, that's wonderful!" Except for the child on the lamppost, who said, "Oh, well, he's completely naked. What are you talking about?" It's as if we're brainwashed into thinking that there isn't this incredible beauty or incredible connectedness around us. Have a look for yourself and then follow 
the teachings and the readings that you find that really affirm what you're really experiencing or what you want to look at. I'm going to finish just by mentioning Mary Elsa, some of the questions James asked, Jane is asking about the present moment. Uh, Scott is uh, talking about what's what's it that prevents people from living to their full potential. Mark wonders why religion isn't serving its purpose or is it? Uh, Helen is asking about the greatest quality you think humans possess. Um, Emma's asking about the spirit, importance of spirituality in your life. Uh, Faye about forgiveness um, and um, I'm going to ju just say a quick word about um, uh, about forgiveness and forgiving ourselves and I'm going to read out at the close what Millie has just dropped into the box. Me say something about forgiveness. Yes yeah and forgiving ourselves. Yeah well forgiveness. Ugh. I mean in your own life you could have had so much unforgiveness. Yes. But you didn't. No. There's a um, a slightly selfish or not selfish, a, 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 a useful step of forgiveness is to uh, free yourself from being drawn into the battle that something else instigated and becoming inevitably continuing to be part of that battle, being drawn down into it. I forgive because I don't want to be part. I don't want to be angry for the hatred. I don't want to be turned into that person. I forgive because I, I do not want to participate in that anymore and I refuse to be a victim anymore. That's a one step. But there's a, for me, there's been a, 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 a and I had that step, um, and that was uh, uh, fierce to take that step for me. Um, but there's a, a next step for me, which was about love. And uh, deciding that I would wanted to see whether this love and compassion is is real enough to change lives and I'm willing like a Pascal's wager willing to really to really step forward for that not condone and not put myself in that harm's way again and again but stay loving I think that's the key. And half of what Jesus, over half, I, I was reading today of what he talks about in the Gospels is about forgiveness. And much of the rest of what he talks about is love. Um, Mary Elsa, I'm going to just read out what Millie says. Please thank Mary Elsa for her wonderful talk. What a privilege to hear her talking about her life and beliefs with such incredible candor, warmth uh, and, 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 and realism. I, I, I love also the way that you don't rush into answers. There's something in our world in universities uh, as elsewhere where we have to have them answer immediately and anything that, uh, and the quality of the contemplative responses that you've given us uh, and deeply thoughtful and compassionate. Uh, is one of the takeaways from this talk for me. We're going to finish that slightly just over the hour. Apologies to everyone looking. Thank you so much for joining us. But above all, thank you so much above all to you for, for being with us for this very special hour on this Sunday evening in September. Thank you. Really lovely to be in conversation with you all. Thank you for having me.